Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to spend time uh, studying this language. I pray that you would make our time profitable. Get, grant me clarity as I teach so that the students will be able to understand readily and appropriate this information. And ultimately, our desire is that their ability to to exegete your word would grow and that your name would be glorified in their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, I want to check and see, did you get a chance to read this handout before uh, the lecture this evening? Andrew? Yes, I read over it. Okay, and Justin? No, I did not. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to walk through the handout with you. And if you have questions at any point, please just say, got a question, okay? And, uh, hey, that's fine. Come on in. So a, po a popular theory in the modern study of grammar is the concept of transformations. The various grammatical constructions of a language are considered to be transformations of a kernel structure, which is defined as the simplest construction in the language that conveys a complete thought. In English, the kernel construction consists of a subject and predicate, where the predicate is a present active indicative verb with its complement, either a direct object, predicate noun, or adjective, and so on, if required by the verb. So here's an example of a kernel. Christ is coming. Christ is the subject, the predicate is coming. And that kernel statement can be transformed into a compressed form, although in this case there's actually more words used. Normally the kernels are shorter. The coming of Christ. And what we did is we took the verb coming, made it a noun, and then attached Christ with the preposition of. Uh, Paul preaches the gospel, can be transformed in terms of a passive verb. The gospel is being preached by Paul. Or uh, a genitive transformation would be the gospel of Paul, which would be the gospel Paul preaches. So in the process of transformation, the kernel often becomes obscured, and back transformation is the process of restoring a transformation to its underlying kernel thought, thus eliminating the ambiguity introduced by the transformation. This is a valuable tool in Greek exegesis since back transformation helps us to discover the potential semantic structures underlying the surface structure. Now, um, I was, just before I got on here, hang on a sec, let me see if I can find the uh, uh, PowerPoint that I developed. I'd like to ex talk to you about um, surface structure and semantic structure. Did I, have I talked about that concept in any of the lectures so far? I think maybe a little bit. Okay. With indirect discourse one of the times. All right. That sounds about right. Um, okay, well, I'm not quickly finding what I was looking for, so I'll just... Um, if... Let's see here. Let me take this off. I thought that I saw a place where... I could, um, no, I don't want cameraman. I thought I saw a place where I could do a kind of like a screen share with, with you guys. I mean, a, um, uh, a, hmm, what, what's the, what are these apps down here? Well, all right, I'm not seeing that, so we'll just, uh, imagine, uh, so I'll use my hand. Up here is the surface structure at the top. 
The surface structure is what you see in the text of a book. And below that is the semantic structure. And the semantic structure is the meaning level. And we can go, what we do when we read, we, we encounter surface structure and we transform that back down into semantic structure, the basic meanings, and when we communicate we take the semantic structure and put it up here in the surface structure. Okay, And the key, uh, the relationships between the semantic structure and surface structure are two. Number one, one, one semantic structure down here at the bottom can be transformed into multiple surface structures up at the top. And uh, so specifically, for example, uh, I can communicate the idea of something happening at the same time as something else by using a present tense adverbial participle. I can use n to plus an infinitive on the surface structure, or I could use the the, uh, the particle host and say host plus a verb then or, or as he walked down the road, such and such happened, and you don't have to have a participle with host. So in that way, the semantic structure is being transformed into multiple surface structures. Now, with the genitive, what we have is up here at the top, the surface structure is identical to many semantic structures at the bottom. The exact same surface structure, an X of Y construction is... Um, uh, reflective of up to 35 different semantic structures. <laughs> so, uh, very complex and um, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about surface structure and semantic structure. Some people call semantic structure the deep structure of a language. Uh, the most helpful book that I've read on this topic was by two guys, John Beekman and John Callow. Beekman is spelled B-E-E-K-M-A-N. And I'll just stick this into the chat box on the left side of the screen. John Beekman and uh, John uh, Callow. And their work is entitled uh, Translating the Word of God. Translating the Word of God. It's out of print, but... It's available through used stores online and uh, really very helpful. If you'd like to go down the road that I'm just giving you a brief overview with here in this lecture, that would be a great place to start. All right, so coming back to this handout, I'm on the third full paragraph. A good example of a transformation whose underlying semantic structure may be better understood by means of back transformation is the X of Y or genitive construction. Now in order to back transform such a construction we must understand what the semantic classification is for the X and the Y. Okay, and there are four possible things. Things, events, abstracts, and relations. Okay, and for the purpose of the genitive uses, we're going to only use the first three, things, events, abstracts, and relations. Things include objects or entities that participate in events. Events, you have to broaden your conception of that word to include actions, processes, or happenings, even st states, states of being. And uh, this little sentence here beside number two is really important. When determining whether a word represents an event, check to see if it has verbal cognates. If so, it may be an event word. And so that means that because the word uh, basilus, king, 
is cognate to the verb basiluo. The word king, basilus, can be considered a uh, event word because a king is a person who does the act of ruling. Or take, for example, the word um, well, the first one that's coming to mind is georgos, which I'm not sure is a word that you guys have learned. It's the word for worker, georgos, and it's related to er ergadzomai. Um, and uh, so a worker, obviously, is somebody who works. Therefore, the worker can be considered an event word. Abstract is a word that denotes a quality or a quantity. So when we're working with an X of Y phrase, what you do is you express any event word as a verb. You ex express abstracts as adjectives or adverbs and things as nouns. Then you state the X and the Y in a kernel statement that expresses the relationship that from the context exists between them. So for example, here's uh, six English examples. Uh, there's the preaching of the cross. Okay, so if I were going to analyze this, uh, let's do this together. Uh, Justin, what type of word, thing, event, or abstract is the word preaching? Um, I would say that's an event. Okay, an event word. Andrew, what about cross? Thing. Okay, cross is a thing. Could cross be an event word? Yeah, I think. Okay, so stauros, the word for cross, is related to stauro, I crucify. Okay, so in this case, we'll I, I would put an I would write on my paper here e slash t above the cross to indicate that it could be both of those possibilities. Um, now, the back transformation here is just taking it as an E of a T, an event of a thing. Someone preaches, that's the event, the cross, and cross has to be here uh, as a, um, oh, what's this figure of speech called? Metonymy. It's metonymy where uh, it's part for the whole or a key topic that's associated with the message, so the message of the cross. And so we call this an objective uh, genitive because cross is what's being preached. Anything about that that uh, doesn't make sense? Okay, the glory, uh, the God of glory, God is uh, a thing. Glory uh, is, uh, well, it could be a thing if it's referring to heaven. It could be an abstract if it's referring to his glorious nature. It could be uh, an event if we're talking about the act of glorifying. Okay. And uh, one of the bad things about these examples is there's no context. And we're going to have to depend heavily on context when we seek to analyze the relationship between a genitive and its uh, pregenitive. In this case, the author, who's me, meant God is glorious. So that's the kernel underlying, and this would be a description, a, a genitive of description. Okay, the glory of the Father. Uh, here, the same... Uh, Colonel, the Father is glorious, but it got transformed up to the surface structure with glory first and Father second. And uh, we would call this a genitive of reference because the Father is the genitive, it's the Y in the word. And it's with reference to the Father that glory is being um, ascribed. A cup of water. Well, a cup's a thing, and water's a thing, but a cup of water is uh, a cup contains or has water in it. 
So we'd call that a generative of content. Um, uh, a ball of wax is the exact same surface structure, same thing of a thing relationship, but a ball is not something that contains wax, it's something that's made of wax. And so we would call a ball of wax an example of a genitive of material, what it's made of. Okay. And uh, another one I like to use is a bird of prey. That, uh, uh, you know, what, what do we mean when we say, oh, look at that majestic bird of prey uh, floating in the sky? Well, Prey here is an event word. The bird is the thing, and this is a bird that preys on other birds. And so this is a subjective genitive where the bird, or it's an event, sorry, it's an event word where the word event genitive, where the word uh, prey is functioning as an event in a kernel, a bird that preys on other birds or on other animals. All right, now I'm gonna. This can sound really confusing, really heavy, but uh, I'm gonna break this all down, hopefully, simply, and uh, help you uh, see how to make application of this. So, a little, a few more comments here, and then we'll start looking at examples. Notice that the verb of the kernel is sometimes derived from the name of the genitive use that identifies the proper relationship between X and Y. So, for example, in number four, a cup contains water, so we call that a genitive of content. In the case of a genitive of description or a genitive of reference, you state the thing as the subject of a linking verb and the abstract as a predicate adjective. So, for example, uh, a heart of hardness is, uh, the underlying kernel is a heart is hard. Hardness is the abstract, heart is the thing, and you state it with a linking verb. Now the basic function of the genitive case is definition, and the following is a listing of the different uses of the genitive case based on what they define. Okay, so I'm now on page two. Uh, any questions so far? No. All right. Now, uh, we've got, I've got the genitive uses broken up into, uh, let's see, three categories, I think. Genitives that um, limit nouns or adjectives on page two, and then page four, genitives that define verbs and genitives that follow various things, which is basically the leftover category uh, that's not as neat as the previous two. Okay, so let's start with uh, page two, genitives that limit nouns or adjectives. Uh, first year Greek, I teach students that the genitive is the case of possession. And uh, it's true, the genitive does indicate possession. So the relationship between... Um, let's see... Uh, the relationship between X and Y in a genitive of possession is that Y owns X. Okay? So remember, we talk about an X of Y relationship. So in Mark 1, 7, we get... Uh, I'm going to mute you temporarily, Justin, just till you get your microphone fixed. And, uh, okay, there we go. How's that? You back with us now? Justin? Did we lose you? No, we didn't lose you. Looks like we may have lost him. Oh, no, I don't want to eject you from the Hangout. <laughs> <laughs> you still there, Justin? Let's see. Chat tells me when people leave. Justin, just he, he left the chat group. So hopefully he's going to join us back. He's typing.
Okay, no problem. I'll keep going. Um, all right. So picking up back where we left off. Um, sandals of him. Sandals is the X. Of him is the Y. He owns the sandals. Okay, so the kernel of that is the sandals that he owns or he owns sandals, either one. Now, in this case, possession is a T of a T, where the first T is usually impersonal and the second T is usually personal. And I say usually because in the first century, you could own a person, and therefore a slave of somebody could be considered a genitive of possession since we're talking about their uh, that, that slave is the person's property. Okay, but most of the time we don't think of people owning people, just people owning things. So uh, here's uh, how I handle genitives that re refer to the body or parts of the body. I don't view me as owning my head, my hands, my eyes, my nose, and so on. I view those as parts of my body, okay? Not as property that I own. I will, that takes me to number three, which is when we talk about body parts, I'm going to understand those to be, uh, like the head of Philip is a genitive of the whole, where Philip is the whole of which the head is a part. Mm. Okay. Um, back up to number two here, relationship. Y has a family relationship to X. So I'm going to insist on family relationship. Now, family can be fairly extended, cousins, uncles, and so on. doesn't have to be immediate family. Uh, and uh, we have spiritual family relationships. We're brothers and sisters, and so... Uh, my brother Timothy, the brother of me, is going to be a genitive of relationship because Timothy exists in a spiritual family relationship. But other relationships that are non-family will not be categorized as a genitive of relationship. Uh, the uh, the uh, TEA analysis here is that we have a T of a T. Normally both are persons, person of a person. So Jacob of Zebedee is the Greek way of saying James, the son of Zebedee. Or the mother of Jesus, clearly a family relationship. 